Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. This week, I bring another Where Are You Now guest, Daniel Felt. How are we doing? It's been so. Nope. Yeah, it has been a minute. I, I don't even remember how long. Is it a year? It messed yeah. about a year and a half. Yes, yeah. two yeah. years. So, so, Daniel, please give give the listeners a quick background of your story, and then we'll, we'll ask some questions to see where the heck have you been. So give them a yeah. little background. What, what business, again, are you running? Yeah, uh, there's 11 of them. So I'll I'll tell you, but but they all kind of, they're, they're intertwined. <laughs> so I started Cura Home Maintenance in 2016. It's a routine home maintenance company. We visit our clients' homes once a quarter, do all the routine maintenance items you're supposed to be doing as a perfect homeowner, but no one is doing. We have about 850 people set up on that. And um, we've grown to kind of like summarize the story. We've tried different unique ways to grow. Uh, we tried to expand with corporate owned locations, and I found difficulties in that of trying to manage a technician a thousand miles away, which is just really challenging. Uh, we, we thought about going the franchise route. And close rate on franchises are really low. And ultimately, I didn't want to be babysitting franchisees either. And so um, since our call, we switched to a licensing route where we're training people how to do exactly what we're doing up here in Minnesota, how to build, scale your business. And um, you can call it whatever you want. You just can't call it Cure Home. And I lost you. Oh, I lost there for a second. You're back. Yeah, sorry. That's that is me. My says my internet connection is unstable for a second here. Oh, you're good. So you're talking about specifically how those individuals cannot call themselves Cure Home. Yeah. So the main difference between a franchise and a license is uh there's there's two main things number one you can't use our our name so you just have to call it something different and the second is the the way that the rules happen so i can't enforce you to do anything it's your business and now we kind of become more of like a, a consultant almost for your business so yeah walk us walk us through the difference right there the the franchise model versus the licensing model what what are the biggest differences yeah, if you were going to go, if you were looking at buying a franchise today, I'll kind of walk you through that process. Um, you would, you, you're falling into a system at, and, and it works for a lot of people, but you're falling into a system of this is the way we do it. And this is the way you're going to do it. Um, I was just reading a story on uh, someone who's buying UPS franchises and they were talking about how profitable the PO boxes are. And they're like, well, why don't you add more PO boxes? And it's like, well, the franchise or, UPS dictates the store layout. And so we can't add more PO boxes, even though that's the most profitable part of our business. So if you were a licensee of uh, UPS, for example, you could lay out, you could put however many PO boxes you want or your store allows because it's your store. You're not falling underneath this category of things that you have to do. So in a franchise, if it's, if for some people it works great because you're being told exactly what to do. Just tell me what to do, not do it. And they're, they're very coachable, very, you know, just let me do my thing. Let me, let me do what you want me to do. And I'll stay in those guidelines. And it's, it's awesome. You know, uh, for pop Murphy's like, tell me where to buy the cheese. And I'll buy the cheese. Right. And um, a lot of people that we were talking to in the home service industry, when they were contacting us, they were saying, I already am. I'm already a plumber or a handyman, a home inspector, whatever it is. I'm already in the home service industry. I already have my own company name. And I just want to do what you're doing. I just want to add it on to my current business. And with the franchise model, that wouldn't really make sense because now, I, now I'd have to say, okay, well, you need to drive a 2021 or newer Ram ProMaster and you need to put this decal on it and, and you have to, here's everything you have to do. It wasn't making sense for these people to have to change and start a new brand in the home service industry. And there are some really strong brands in the home service industry. Don't get me wrong. Some have excelled greatly. However, if I was going to interview someone in a different state than Minnesota and say, do you know who Kira home is? They chances are pretty low. And we, and we've gotten out there. Like we have some of our social media has gotten 40 plus million views on some of our videos. Like we're, we're out there, but the chances of that strong brand recognition is really low. So because of all those factors, when we had people telling us, we really love your concept, we just 
don't see the nece the necessity of buying the name, we came up with a solution of selling licenses to make that work. What were some of the biggest challenges that kind of, because I do recall our conversation when we first met was about the franchise model and what you're trying to do in, uh, in that space. What was some of the challenges that you kind of uh, went through in that franchise period that ultimately decided to make you pivot? Yeah, a lot of it was just having, you know, the, the close rate, the close rate is so low. I mean, you're talking 0.5 to 1% close rate, maybe. Additionally, on the franchisor side, you're having to pay several brokers a monthly fee just to have your name thrown into the hat to maybe potentially be brought up to someone looking to buy a franchise. So there's an ongoing cost, and I'm talking like four to $800 per brokerage. There's multiple brokerages that you want to be involved in. So it's the franchise, either you go big and you go big fast and you make it, you, you scale it or you're not going to make it. And, and that's where I, a lot of franchises, they never, you never even hear about them because they never go. So I was spending a bunch of time. I think I ended up talking to about 120 different potential franchisees actually having in-person conversations with them. We actually invited a few of them to Minnesota for, they call it a discovery day where you come and we show you everything that we do. I sent them along, ride with my crews and everything. And the majority, the bat, all the feedback, they're like, we don't know why we, but like the franchise doesn't just seem right. Like some of them even said, could I pay you? Like, could I pay you just to show me how to do this? And with the way that our business works, I could show you everything that I could do. I could completely pull the curtain back and say, here's my operations manual. Here's, here's all that stuff. However, in a home service industry, I'm a huge believer that if you don't have ongoing support of some kind, it's going to be your, your chances of being successful goes down significantly. So for that reason, we provide ongoing support. I meet with each one of our licensees. You, most of them are half hour to an hour, once a week or every two weeks, just to say, how's it going? What do you plan on doing this week? And then, you know, if they have any questions, I answer them to the best of my ability or like say, you know, I think this book would be a really great book for you to read. Cause that kind of is, talks about the problem you're having. Just try to steer people in the right direction. I don't have all the answers, but to kind of answer your question, Gabriel, the, 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 the huge challenge was talking to hundreds of people and being like, we love what you're doing. It's just not for us. And so it's like, something is wrong here. I'm not, we're not delivering this correctly and delivering it as a franchise was incorrect. Yeah. And then, you know, for the folks at home or the unfamiliar with it, close rate, can you please explain what a close rate is? Yeah. Close rate is essentially how many people do you have to have calling you or contacting you in order to get a customer? So if you have a close rate of 0.5 or 1%, what that means is you're going to need 100. If you have 1% close rate, you'll need to talk to an average of 100 leads to get one customer. And if it's 0.5, you actually need 200 leads. And the sales process for franchises is really, it's a long one. So dealing, nurturing those leads for that long, it was, it's horrible. So it's, it's a, a lot of work for a little reward. In our day-to-day -day business, our close rate is between 50 and 60%, just to give you an idea of, you know, otherwise I, I think the gals in my office would go crazy having a rejection level of 99 or 99.5%. Yeah, and that's that's incredible. You know, it's it's kind of interesting because I think some people think, you know, it's like baseball. You know, if, if you're if you play baseball and you're batting 300, you're in the Hall of Fame. And that's yeah, batting 30 percent. Right. <laughs> you just you just have to be 30 percent uh, hit 30, the ball 30 percent of the times so you're going to be in the Hall of Fame for sure. Now, what you know, you mentioned, actually, now that you've transitioned, you, you kind of got out of the franchise, you're in the licensing world, but this is not the only thing you're doing. You have multiple, multiple things. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk about some of your current projects and ventures you're doing. Yeah, uh, we're dabbling in real estate. We have three short-term rentals in Cape Coral. And we also have a commercial building up in uh, Golden Valley, Minnesota. That's, I would say, like the short-term rentals are actively passive income. Uh, my wife is a stay-at-home mom, but that she's, uh, for tax purposes, a real estate professional managing those properties. So that's that's great. We self-manage them. And um, but other than that, we have a um, a company that we started called Constant Social, and we took the uh, essentially the success that we had from Cura Home uh, of turning our social media into a revenue-driving tool for our business. On average, each day we're we're typically doing between a thousand to two thousand dollars worth of work that is strictly coming from our social media efforts, and we're doing zero dollars in ad spend on 
Facebook and, and Instagram. So we started show, taking, Hey, let's, let's uh, take, let's take this concept. And we launched it right around the beginning of the year. We have 18 clients right now that we're posting for them. We can post every other day daily or uh, twice a day. And then we also do engagement and we're taking engagement kind of a different spin to it. Cause we're not like a lot of people with social media think it's a popularity contest. How many followers do you have? And I could care absolutely less about that. My thing is how much money can social media make for your business? So what we're doing is we're going in, we're doing engagement, of course, the standard way of, of following hashtags with similar people. But additionally, we're going in, and especially if you're a B2B business, this works really well, is we're actually engaging with your potential referral partners or clients on their Facebook. So you're, we're showing them that support, we're liking everything that they're posting, we comment on it, you know, simplistic things like, hey, great post, or if they post like, we got a five-star review, congrats on getting this review, nice work. And if you have, um, if you're a B2C business, we're actually, we're going in and we're doing that with your referral partners. And, and so that your referral partners are seeing your name run across their screen every time that they post. And it's coming across in a really supportive way where if you're sending the same on a frequency, basically any other way, text message, email, you know, newsletter, anything, they'd be annoyed as I'll get out. But when you're supporting people on social media, it's, uh, they, they really appreciate that. And why, why is that so important? It's like for a small business, for an entrepreneur that's starting their business, they're, they're posting on social media, they're trying to figure out the algorithm. Why is engagement so important? Yeah, I mean, you could post the most incredible, valuable content in the world on your Facebook page, but if no one's seeing it, it's completely pointless. So you got to get in front of eyes. And the way that the algorithm works with you know Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, basically all of them, is they want to show content to the you know, they want to show valuable content. They want their users to have a good experience. And, and it's all about how much time can we keep you on the platform? So they're wanting to show relevant stuff. So when you start doing engagement with other people, and then that gets them to start doing engagement back with you because they've become aware of you, Facebook says, hey, this is the, the, the algorithm show that, hey, this is valuable content. There's people clicking on it. They're looking at it. They're spending time on it. It's all, it's all you know, driven by stats and data. You know, there's not a person sitting here doing this, but it's showing like, hey, look, this video is viewed for 4.3 seconds rather than typical like 2.5. People are interested in this and all of a sudden it, it, it hits and people start watching it more. Additionally, uh, especially for small businesses and you're just trying to grow your SEO, that uh, social media has become a subcategory of SEO. And so Facebook or Google is crawling these websites multiple times. And so if you're not posting regularly and you're not telling Google what you want to do and where you want to do it, it doesn't know. So we're actually posting on eight different platforms, including you can update your Google business profile every single day. You should be doing that. We update it at Kira Home. We update it 50 to 70 times a week and we actually geotag the photo. So we tell it, hey, we cleaned a dryer vent in Maple Grove, Minnesota. Here's a photo of it. That goes on our Google My Business. That goes on our on Google Maps and it updates the service page on our website. So that when Google's crawling our website multiple times per day, it's seeing, look, we were in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we cleaned a dryer vent. Here's a photo of it. And to even help you more, uh, Mr. Google, Mrs. Google, parent of what all controls 90% of all search traffic, I included a photo of everything for you. So here you go. Look, and I did it multiple times. Google is trying to, to scrunch down where your service area is and what you are, because it's, it's hard to be everything to everyone. And Google wants all of us to be happy. So they want you to like dominate little areas. They want you to be spending more money in, in other areas. So it's a constant battle of, of trying to show Google, like, look, give your clients a great experience, send them to my website. I'm, I'm re reputable. I'm, I'm playing your game. I'm playing your rules. I'm doing what you want me to do. So give me more of what I want. You know, that's, it's, it's kind of funny. It really is just playing uh, like the algorithm game, but understanding what the algorithm is. And yes. folks, at the end of the day, the algorithm is value. You know, um, however you're able to create good content and value. And, and, you know, what you're saying, Daniel, is accurate, too, is not only that, but how do you get your content in front of people, right? Create an audience. Uh, right. and, and there are various ways to do that. And, you know, I would encourage you to explore them all because I, I, I'm trying to do various ones, uh, the newsletter, right? The blog posts, the websites. Now, how do you manage, like, I'm assuming you probably have a team at this point. But for a, a for an individual that's you know a small business owner, a founder, an entrepreneur out there, how would you manage? You, you mentioned you're on like eight different sites. How do you manage them all? 
Well, I would hire Cons Social, but uh, besides <laughs> besides the sales pitch, uh, the biggest thing that I would strongly encourage people to do is is get some sort of scheduling software that you can use. Um, you've heard of Hootsuite. We let people use ours as well if you want for a very affordable rate. What you can do is you can actually pre-schedule everything out. So like for our clients, we send them an approval link once a month and that's the content for the next month. So we're not, you're not like approving every single thing, every single day, you can click approve or you could comment, you know, Daniel, this sucks, change it. And we, we change it up, but you got to have some sort of software where you're not sitting there, you know, before you go to bed or whatever, you're trying to keep up. I mean, as entrepreneurs, especially for small service-based businesses or any small business, you have to wear so many hats and there, and there's only more coming at you. So for social media, my, my one hopeful thing that you can do is, is to post content that is, it's not just all salesy. So we actually follow a process where we'll do, you know, obviously like testimonial. So we'll, you know, testimonial Tuesday, we'll put questionnaire, we'll put um, tips and tricks. We'll put like a question, like, did you know, just to do all this thing. So six days a week, we're putting content up that is not salesy. If at one day of the week, we'll put up a promotional, like it's time to get your air ducts clean, call now, call today, click here. And that's only one time. So just being educational and, and informative, but like, let it be a reflection of your personality. Don't try to like make up something or be someone you're not. Like if you have a sense of humor, let that come out through you on social media and be witty. Like, you know, the, you, you'll attract people that you want to work with, you know, don't, don't try to fake it. So if you can sit down and say, okay, I've got most entrepreneurs have like thousands of photos of their work on their phone. I'm just going to start scheduling this. It doesn't have to be anything. It doesn't have to be like incredibly beautiful. It doesn't have to be Photoshopped or made in Adobe or Canva or anything like that. Just get something posted and start telling the world what you're doing. Because if yeah, I've talked to entrepreneurs that are sitting here and they're like, oh, I'm just frustrated. You know, I don't have any sales. And I look, I'm like, okay, well, you haven't updated your Facebook since the 4th of July. So I don't even know if you're in business. Like I, I, you know, I can't do a pulse check on you. You haven't gotten any Google reviews. Are you asking for them? Like online, you're not telling me or the internet that you even want business because you're not updating anything. So you have to go out and you have to say, like, I actually want business. So putting a post that says we're accepting clients. We have an appointment available next Thursday. You know, anything like that is, is really great. So just post anything, even if it's a photo, if you're a pressure washer and here's a clean sidewalk, clean the sidewalk today, accepting appointments next week. Have a great day. You know, anything it's like, Oh, sweet. Like they're, they're accepting appointments. So anything is better than nothing and use a schedule scheduling software to help build that out. Yes. I would, I would always encourage like operations first, create like an operational guideline, a map, just to kind of help you get started. Cause that operations, uh, when done, after the fact, or it's very difficult to kind of start, you know, afterwards. Now, Daniel, you know, we a year and a half ago, you're on the show. Let's let's how much we and what have you learned most within the last year? How much? What are some of the things? You obviously, you know, you pivoted into a, a different kind of um, for a different a different style versus franchise versus licensing, right? But then you also brought in some other businesses. What is what is the biggest thing you probably learned within the last year and a half that's helped you prepare yourself for today? Uh, you know, I think, um, a lot of the changes that we've made has been, have been due to the economy, uh, people, you know, in the home service business, it just, you know, the, the fact of it is like, as of today, I, if you go to the grocery store and you buy the exact same thing you bought a year ago, it, your grocery bill went up. Like it, it's just, it's, it's, it's the way it is. And for a lot of people that we're finding their, their income has not followed the rate of inflation for consumer goods and especially necessary goods. And so we had to cure home is doing great. We're still growing, uh, but I wanted to be growing bigger, better, and faster than what it is. And so how do you do that? Right? Like, do you have two operations managers? Like, do you, you know, how do you grow and scale this? And so we looked at different ways of how do we help other people that are being stalled out right now in this economy. And there's several people in the home service industry that their services have been, not like deemed by a government official or anything like that, but they're just not as essential. And when the economy is going down, they're looking for some sort of repetitive income in their business. And so for us, we have 850 clients that are set up on auto pay. A lot of them are higher in the clients. We're not the first service to go, you know, if times do get a little tight. And a lot of times for a lot of these consumers, like they're, it's not super tight. So that's one, that's one way that we've pivoted. Additionally, 
for the social media business, that is also the type of business that when people are feeling tight or like, hey, I'm, my phone's not ringing as much, having that style of business is also one that grows when the economy is not doing as well. When your typical business is not doing as well, they look at what do I need to be doing differently. Additionally, a lot of business owners in their 40s, 50s, early 60s, not to rip on you or anything like that, but they know social media is important, but they could not post a reel or a video or a photo on Facebook if their life depended on it. That's totally fine. I get it. I never post reels myself either. I tried to make a reel a couple weeks ago. I can't do it. Fortunately, I've got a team of five people who can <laughs> live and they, they live and breathe and they do it every single day. I don't even know how to do it but they can post an awesome reel and follow current trends and stuff like that. So we pivoted Gabriel out of, out of necessary, like necessity. Like I, I have a thirst to grow. If I get bored, it's bad. I start, I start another LLC or do something. <laughs> like, like I, I get into like good type of trouble and uh, my, I get I, bored. I start another business. <laughs> yeah. It's bad. I, uh, my goal this year, I told my executive team, my goal is to not start another LLC for the calendar year of 2024. <laughs> And um, they were like, thank God, because last year it kind of got out of hand. So, um, so yeah, so we, we pivoted in a way that it's like, I'm continuing to fill my buckets. Um, you know, when I took a strength finders test, when I was looking at um, picking a college degree, you know, coaching and mentorship was really strong, really high up and selling the licenses and, and coaching and mentoring and supporting these licensees really fills my bucket. Like to watch these guys be successful. And, you know, we had a guy in Florida, he was capped at doing $400 a day. And he's now doing between twelve and eighteen hundred dollar days. He had a six thousand dollar week last week, no problem. And he's like, "Dude, this was not even. I didn't. If you would have told me this a year ago, I, I would have said that's impossible." He tripled his. He does Christmas lights in the fall. Tripled that. We don't even do Christmas lights, but just by telling him, "Hey, in my experience, I would recommend trying this." So then, and the accountability. I'm no like business guru or whiz, but like if you meet with me on Friday morning and you say next week I'm going to do this, this, and this, and then I write that down, and next week. After we jump on our call, I say, hey, did you get this, this, this done? It, it, you know, it only has to happen once or twice. You're like, okay, I'm going to start getting the crap done that I told this guy I was going to get done. So that's really been fulfilling uh, for me as well. Yeah. You know, I think uh, coaching, you know, we started our, our, our business, uh, um, business accelerator program here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And that has just been phenomenal because you're seeing uh, just this morning, I had a couple of uh, pitch competitions. We're, we're doing a pitch competition. And so one of the things I really excel at is pitches. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of where my focus is like, you know, public speaking and doing pitches, closing deals. That's kind of where I, where I've business development is really where I focus yeah. on. Now, one of the things that was interesting is you're, you're kind of going through these stories and you're working with them and doing their pitches and you start to see them when they start to get it, right? Mm -hmm. That that aha moment, like, ah, this is making sense because you really want to create a story through your pitch, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then at the end, what's your ask, right? Leave them with the ask and how to contact you. And so each one, folks are listening, if you ever do a pitch, the very last frame you should leave with an ask and make sure you have a QR code for them to contact mm -hmm. you. How can they get a hold of you? But, but, but more importantly, what is your ask? You know, it might be, um, hey, support me. It might be some need some funding. Uh, it might be stop by the shop and, you know, whatever the ask is, make it, make it an actionable thing, right? Now, mm -hmm. You know, you're looking forward, you said one of the things you're not going to do is create another LLC, but what are, what are some of the future goals and aspirations of Daniel? What's, what is your plan? What is the next five years look like? Yeah. Uh, right now uh, for Cura Home, we're really getting, like, I felt like a year ago, I would say our systems and processes were really dialed in. You know, every single time we've had a callback, we've documented why we got the callback. What can we do in the future to prevent that callback? I mean, we even have in our SOP, like the garbage disposal invent is invented in Racine, Wisconsin in 1927. Okay. Who gives a crap? But <laughs> when you're talking to a, a, a homeowner, you gotta you know, know that stuff, man. Gotta know it. Right. Yeah. Hey, I, I mean, pull out the stat. I'm always like, yeah, Oregon is 98,000 square miles. Everybody's like, why the yeah. hell do you know that? I'm like, because yeah. I support the entire state. That's right. Why. Yeah. Exactly. So I felt like we had stuff dialed in, but now I'm finding that there is like, as the world progresses very quickly from an AI standpoint and all of a sudden, that's like the key, like the trending term right now, it's probably gonna be the word of the year, but there's so many opportunities coming up to really like run your business more efficiently and more profitably. And like, I believe, like, I don't, I don't think we're going to replace anyone's job at Cure Home. But I think like implementing AI, I believe by January 1st of 2025, 
we will have an AI system that will be able to answer your texts, your email, and your phone calls. And you will not be able to tell that it's AI because we can tell it, we will be able to tell it to, I want you to have a Minnesota accent. I want you to say, um, every once in a while. And I want you to like start over a word or two. You know, I think, I, I think we're going to be there in a very short order. Like, and so I'll, I'll need someone to oversee that. So I, again, I don't think I'm going to replace my office manager, but we're finding like through all these CRM systems and all these things that there's an insane amount of automation that you can put into your business. And it takes a minute. It takes time to get that. And you got to really understand it a lot before you can just roll it out. But there's a huge opportunity for us to like, similar to back in the day, how, if you were a ginormous company, you get a lot of buying power. Well, now with these systems and processes for our licensees, now we currently have eight and I think we're gonna have 24 by the end of the year based on how everything's going. But we have a, we're getting a lot of buying power and the ability to say, hey, considering that we're going to roll this out for 8, 10, 20, 25 people, I'm willing to dive in and get this process in place so that they can all, rather than paying five or $600 for a CRM system, I'm just going to create my own. And all of you, if you guys can all pay me like 40 or 50 bucks, that'll support the person who's going to, you know, be running it for us. And we're all, all of a sudden all saving $450 a month. So that's really what I'm focused on this year is, is really running extremely profitable businesses and helping all of our licensees run lean, mean, and very efficient and profitable. Yeah, creating an internal CRM uh, would be phenomenal because the the amount of the licensing, especially for the enterprise, once you're at that large of a stage, just becomes pretty astronomical. And mm -hmm. there tends to be a limited amount of CRM that you're willing to um, kind of trust all their data with, and and they they know it, and so they're willing to they're willing to charge a pretty penny for it as well. Exactly. So, you know what what did you know you've been doing this for some time. You, you've done the licensing, you've done the franchise. What advice would you give some of the listeners uh, that are listening? In fact, folks that are listening, uh, I want to point out, if, if you didn't miss, if you didn't hear Daniel, he is in fact going to start this AI. So he might be looking for someone. So just folks that are out there in the AI space, this is a call to action. Please feel free to reach out to Daniel. Uh, he does have LinkedIn. In fact, you can find this stuff. Great opportunity to plug the newsletter, the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Go to theshadesv.com, subscribe to the newsletter, and we'll have this information. Now, Daniel, what advice do you have for some of these listeners? Yeah, I think the largest thing that a lot of people get sidetracked from at all several levels is just not taking the time to write down your goals and then stay focused on them. I talk to so many entrepreneurs. I'm in a networking group with 110 people that I see every Wednesday morning. And all these people have incredible ideas. They're super smart. But what I find is that the people who set themselves apart are the people that are like endurance athletes when it comes to like mentally thinking about their business. And it's someone who can like consistently say, and, it, and I'll, uh, you know, Traction EOS talks a lot about this, but hey, here's our five, three and one year goals. And what do we have to do in the next 90 days to accomplish those goals? And can I sit down with my team? Or if you're a one man show, that's great too. Can I sit down once a week and say, am I focused on getting everything done that I'm supposed to be getting done in the next 90 days so that I'm accomplishing what I want to get done in the next five years? Otherwise, what happens is all of a sudden it's New Year's again. And you're like, holy cow, like there goes another year. And it's just gone. Life happens really, really fast. So I think it's extremely important to write down your goals, have some level of mentorship or coaching in your life. It's extremely important. The re, you know, even if Michael Phelps had a swim coach, everyone needs a coach, right? I mean, like if you want to be the best, you'd hire a coach. You hire someone to be holding you accountable on some level. And you got to stay focused because being being really great at business, I think is all about consistency and consistency wins championships. You got to be able to do the same thing a crap ton of times in order to be successful. Man, I cannot have said it better myself. Uh, the, the repetition is everything. You know, it's funny. I, I, I did a, had a comment about um, the, one of the things I do constantly every day is, is make my bed, right? Just mm -hmm. be consistent about making my bed when I wake up in the morning. And people are like, oh, I, I'm like, you know, I've actually heard that individuals that make their bed every morning, uh, the percentage of them becoming millionaires is like, you know, exponentially higher. Just because, mm -hmm. again, it's about being consistent in everything and what you do. Um, it was funny, I was having a conversation just this last weekend talking about how when Kobe passed away, 
everybody remembers where they were at when Kobe passed away. And I, I was talking about, you know, when I w- used to watch him, I'm a, you know, I'm a huge Blazer fan. And so watching him is, you know, kind of the enemy, right? But then when he passed away, mm-hmm. he became and he became idolized because because of his work ethic, because you started hearing about these Kobe Bryant stories, about how hard he worked, about his practice, about his practices and his work ethic and just everything he did, did on a daily basis. You begin to kind of think, man, that's what it that's why he was so good at what he did. And that's what I need to do in order to be great, just like him, you know? Right. Yep. Yeah, man, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. You know, all these people kind of were like. So we, we just launched a social media company. And I tell people like, like, so what's, you know, what's this going to do for my business? I'm like, that's, that's great. That's a great question. But I, you know, no one ever talks about how great Kobe was like the first day that he went to practice. And I tell people that was social media. And that's the same thing of everything in your business. Like this isn't going to change your, it's not going to be mind blowing results from one post or one day going to the gym or one day of making your bed, but you do that consistently over time. And all of a sudden you're creating these habits that turn you into an excellent version of who you are and yeah i couldn't agree more on the making your bed thing i've i've gotten into the habit of of i I get up at 5 a.m seven days a week and i've got time alone my son is like a he's three and a half but i swear he's an 80 year old farmer (laughs) and uh he gets up at 7 a.m sharp we have to he has an alarm clock where the light turns on when he can get up and he i'll watch him on the monitor and he's he sits on the edge of bed waiting for that light to go off but um i get two hours to just do do my thing in the morning and and to get a quick workout in you know to study what I want to study and to have some reflection time catch up on emails for a little bit if I want to have a cup of coffee I'm two hours into my day before most people have that have hit the floor and and that has been really beneficial for me I don't need to go to bed earlier my body is just adapted and it's no problem I like my wife thinks I'm crazy and all that stuff but hey it's 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 working well like I'm I'm more efficient than I've ever been my entire life. And I'm, I'm not getting younger. I'm, I'm already 34. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm starting to get more and more efficient. I, I feel like my body refuses to like sleeping in at 6 30 AM for me. Like yeah, exactly. 6 30 AM. I'm like, Oh, that's that got some good sleep last night. Yeah. But yeah, yeah our, we, have, we have two kids and those two are up no later than seven 30. And it's mm-hmm. just like all hell's going breaking loose once they're up. So you do have to oh. spend that time and, you know, using it quality time. I think, um, a lot of us sometimes do get lost in the scrolling uh, of, of the mornings. Try to use that as an opportunity to do, learn something. You know, you have 30 minutes to an hour of the day. doesn't have to be something really uh, strenuous or difficult. Try Duolingo. Try to learn a language 30 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. You know, just just something. do something pretty consistently, though, because, again, reputation is going to really get you. Um, it's not practice doesn't – like perfect practice doesn't make perfect right it's just actually practicing makes you perfect uh and so uh again and dan you also mentioned your first video is gonna suck guys i'm sorry your first mm-hmm. post on youtube and your first post it's gonna suck go look at mine they, yeah. they're really good uh they will get better they will get yeah. better and then you will start to get followers you will start to get people i'm starting to learn seo in fact mm-hmm. my last uh my second one of my last uh a YouTube post, we have 20,000 views on that episode. So you're wow. starting to see uh, the engagement. And again, this is after three years. So it didn't mm-hmm. happen overnight, right? But to Daniel's point, it is being, being very consistent and, and not giving up, persevering through those times when you're kind of alone, like in the basement, like, should I continue to still do this? What what makes sense? Uh, right. and, but you continue to do it. And then you all of a sudden you start to see, you know, revenue cycles start to hit and and then you start, it starts to make sense. And so, so Daniel, again, thank you for those kind words, uh, those words of advice for the listeners, because I think that is very important to keep going. Now, before we go, is there any last thing, first how can the folks contact you if they're interested in learning more about you? Maybe they're learning more about your social media company. How can they contact you? Yeah, you mentioned LinkedIn. I'm I'm there, super active. Uh, you can find us online. Cure a Home is, wow, we got some great, gnarly, nasty yes, stuff you do. on there. So yes, follow us on Cure a Home. Yeah, it will make you think about cleaning your house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we're super active there. Um, otherwise, yeah, follow us. Uh, Constant Social is our new company if you're interested in growing your social media we have what I feel is very affordable plans for what we do. We're, we don't lock you in any kind of contract. So we, we try to win your business every single month by doing a great job there. So yeah, you can find us pretty much everywhere and anywhere on, on social media. 
Nice. Daniel, thank you again so much. The Where and the Now series will continue. I really do appreciate it. For folks that are, uh, want this contact information, you can go ahead and subscribe to the newsletter by visiting theshadesofe.com. Those newsletters come out every week. Thank you and have a great night.